everybody. Good day and welcome. And we're excited that you've joined the COPC improving the effectiveness of, of chat session. It's great to have so many of you in attendance today and we hope that you and yours are safe and well. My name is James Camareri and I'm the Vice President of North American Sales here at COPC and I will serve as today's session, session host. I'd like to start by introducing two of my colleagues that I've just been chatting with here, uh, and veteran COPC consultants uh, that'll be leading us through today's event. First, uh, Brent Jernigan, who is a director of consulting for COPC. He offers 15 years of experience in the contact center process improvement um, area while additionally specializing in quality systems and workforce management. And second, Scott Flewelling, who has been with COPC since 1999. He's one of our most senior members of the team. Uh, and he has led engagements in over 15 countries and is our certification practice lead. Both Brent and Scott uh, bring many years of experience on the client outsourced and consultancy sides of the industry and are also responsible for leading performance improvement, vendor management consulting engagements, and of course, delivering many of our best practice training classes. So for those of you that are joining today that have been in some of our classes, it's likely, highly likely that Scott and Brent have been your instructors. The three of us are glad to be with you here today. So as many of you are already familiar with COPC, I'll just take a quick moment to introduce, introduce our organization. We're a consulting firm that's been around since the mid nineties. And as the quote states here, we are relentlessly focused on creating meaningful customer experiences and optimizing business outcomes. We really do this with a focus on performance improvement for operations that support the customer experience. We developed a performance management system and quality management framework known as the COPC customer experience standard covering best practices and CX operations for both in-house and outsourced businesses, vendor management organizations uh, as well. And many high performing organizations follow, are compliant with, or even become certified to the COPC standard. Uh, we are a small but global consulting firm with uh, people in 19 countries. Uh, so we've got team members spread around the globe and we've actually conducted operational improvement engagements, engagements in more than 70 countries. To support all this, our solutions include customer experience strategy consulting, optimization consulting, and training based on the COPC CX standard. Um, and an example of these that really directly relate to chat topics today, you'll notice on the right-hand side within CX strategy that we help clients with designing their service journeys and building centers of excellence. And under utilization, uh, we utilize blueprinting and customer experience operations guides to help our customers optimize their operations. And of course, training um, goes without saying, we'd like to train our clients, team members to maintain uh, these best practices on their own and in many of our training classes that you'll see listed here on the right-hand side. Okay, a couple of quick housekeeping items for today's session. Uh, during the session, uh, the attendees will be muted, but we'll be able to submit questions. So at the bottom of the page, you'll see a Q&A button. Q &A button. Um, so feel free to submit as we go. Our agenda will inc uh, include, include a couple of polls throughout, um, actually a few polls throughout, uh, a 10 to 15 minute session after the presentation in which to field these questions. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, feel free to submit. And we'll close it all out, all out with a final short poll for feedback purposes. So that would be helpful if you take a few moments at the very end of the session to give us a little feedback on today's agenda. All right, with that said, Scott, I'm gonna hand it off to you to get us started. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, James, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And uh, Brent and I uh, really put together this, this agenda. We want to talk about what our objectives for the session uh, in terms of improving effectiveness of, of chat. We want to talk about some common chat models. And uh, some of you may be quite familiar with these, but we just want to set our, our sort of the tone of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll go through some frequent chat issues that we see and talk about some of the solutions um, to those uh, problems. And then uh, really, how does the CLPC CX standard improve chat effectiveness and how does it address chat? And then as James mentioned, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes at the end where we'll deal with some Q&A. And as he uh, also mentioned, please feel free to uh, enter your questions as Brent and I are, are going through the different topics and, uh, and we'll talk about some of those at the end. So let's get started. What, what are the objectives and why did we put this section together? So we find in our consulting work that many organizations embark upon a chat implementation without really a clear vision of what do the customers actually want when they use chat? 
how is this going to impact the customer experience if we implement chat? And, and it could actually have very negative uh, consequences, customer experience, if we do it incorrectly. And then how do we effectively implement the internal uh, processes or processes, depending upon where you are, to meet the customer's needs within the budgetary limitations of what you want to have from a chat uh, perspective? So we put this session together to explain how the COPC CX standard is used as a management system to improve chat effectiveness. Now, I'm going to say, if you're here looking for what's the best chat tool that I should be implementing and the technology uh, for my agents, this is really not the session for you. We certainly uh, have uh, experience in, in technology. Uh, we have partners that we uh, uh, go with for implementing the tools, but that was not the focus of, of what we wanted to discuss today. So we're going to have a lot of research that we're actually going to present as part of the webinar today. And uh, this, this uh, research I'm going to say is really hot off the press. It's the 2020 Customer Experience Management Benchmark, which is called CXMB. Now, uh, this has been produced as an ongoing research partnership uh, between an organization, an excellent organization that we partner with called Execs in the Know and COPC. And uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. And going back, uh, if you want to look at previous versions of the report, uh, those are back to at least 2015 on the COPC website. You can look at executive summaries of selected reports. And so it's COPC.com slash resources slash research, and you can pull up uh, uh, the current year as well as prior years. So what was the methodology um, for the survey? So in total, it was 5,171 uh, consumers aged between the ages of 18 to 99. Now, I don't know how many were in the uh, the last bucket up to 99, but uh, I, that that's what the, uh, that's what the methodology uh, came back and showed us. Um, these were all from the United States uh, that participated in this year's research. Um, if you're not from the United States, honestly, I, I'm not so sure that the results would be very different in your uh, country. Uh, the surveys were designed by our research team, so the COPC uh, uh, Inc. Re CX research team, and the data for the survey was collected using SurveyMonkey uh, audience between uh, July and September of 2020. Uh, so you can see that the results are quite frequent. And uh, honestly, this uh, title of this year's uh, survey was a year like no other uh, because we were surveying during, uh, of course, the pandemic that has gripped all of us uh, worldwide. So uh, I, I think some very interesting results and some of the changes that have occurred in 2020 as a result uh, of what's happening. I, I don't think anybody's surprised about the changes in our industry, but we'll deal with a bit of that in some of the research where we, so sh where we show uh, some of the trends. Uh, respondents uh, for the surveys were are selected from consumers from nearly 3 million people who take surveys on SurveyMonkey platform each day. Uh, respondents have been uh, weighted by age, race, sex, education, geography, uh, using the Census Bureau's uh, American Community Survey to, re to reflect the demographic composition of the United States. So anyway, sure, we've all heard a lot about polling these days and uh, survey weighting, so uh, I won't belabor this slide any further. I'll get to our research, and uh, uh, I think the results of uh, yesterday's uh, yesterday's uh, poll will maybe not be known for a few days uh, in the United States, but we'll leave it at that. All right. So uh, here is the first uh, first bit of what we want to take a look at from the research. And what do customers actually prefer for their channel uh, preference and use? As we can see, over half of the respondents chose phone as the most preferred contact method to resolve a customer service issue, 51%. Um, so that is, uh, that's interesting. Phone, you know, we think phone, oh, maybe it's, it's a dying channel. It is still the preferred channel um, for most of the respondents, for just over half. On the other side, uh, on, the, on the downside, social media messaging, uh, in-person and self-service channels were not that high. If we look at web chat, video chat, that actually accounted for about 30% of the uh, respondents' transactions, which I think is really uh, quite telling. And you know, as Brent, as uh, James introduced Brent and I, he said that we were a veteran consultants. I, I think he meant to say age. Uh, and certainly, I've been with the business long enough with COPC that chat wasn't even a thing uh, when we got started. So we've certainly evolved, and I, I certainly think that the consumers have evolved uh, over time as we look at this. 
So now we get to take a look at some of the historical research relative to these uh, chat channels. And so as we look at phone, we'll certainly see uh, in this question within the past 12 months, which contact center channels have you used to engage with a brand's customer care department? And as we look at that, we'll see that phone um, certainly is still the highest, but it's declining uh, over time as we look at the results from 2016 through 2020. Um, if we uh, sort of focus a little bit more on the uh, the uh, sorry uh, the chat side of things, we'll see that online video chat this year has increased substantially, as well as mobile app uh, mobile chat has increased substantially. So although phone usage continues to decrease, uh, we see uh, that we're actually seeing a lot more uh, in uptake in email chat. Uh, mobile chat, uh, SMS, which is text messaging, chat bots, it has all increased, even though phone is de decreasing. And I, as I said, this is a year like no other. And I think that uh, as organizations from a support point of view have had to move their agents to a work at home environment, as the consumers are working from home themselves, uh, it would appear that these other um, methods of communicating with organizations have become much more prevalent as we've gone through 2020. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, the next topic, which is common chat models. And what are the pros and cons of each of those? So really, uh, I'm sure you're probably familiar with, with all of this. We have chat bots, uh, which is the technology that is used in an automated fashion using AI. Uh, we have live agents uh, as a chat model, and we have the transition from bot to live. So what are the pros of chatbots? Well, chatbots are available 24 seven. They're there, they're ready, they're willing, they're able, they're cost effective. They're very, very uh, accepting and they don't get bored with repetitive tasks and answering the same question over and over. They can very easily multitask between different people who would be interacting with them and they have excellent response time. But what are the cons? They need to be programmed. So the chatbot is only gonna be good as good as the programming that went into it, or it needs to have some sort of machine learning where it improves over time based upon the customer interactions. Um, doesn't always do well uh, with, uh, with uh, spelling errors or sarcasm or emojis, um, and may need to actually interface with legacy systems uh, as well, which can be a challenge for some of the bots. Live agents, uh, can deal with uh, non-standard tasks, um, can certainly do screen sharing with customers and co-browsing, and actually drive much higher levels of issue resolution than a chatbot on its own. However, it's expensive to have live agents, and it's expensive to staff them to customer arrival patterns, which can be quite difficult. And also, they're very session-based they'll understand what's happening in this particular session. However, they may not actually know the history of what's going on in the interaction or, or previous interactions that that consumer may have had with the organization. And then we deal with bot to live. And so we may have transactions that start in a, in a chat bot, and then they move over to a live agent. This is absolutely the best for issue resolution. And uh, if a chatbot has been having trouble with the language issues uh, or the emojis or the spelling errors, then we can move over to a live agent and drive that higher level of resolution. And when well implemented, it can improve overall efficiency for the organization and the response time for the customers. However, there are some cons. It may be difficult for the agent to catch up. Let's suppose that the uh, consumer has been in a bot conversation for five, eight, 15 minutes. Uh, how is the agent going to catch up on that when it's transitioned over to, the, to the, the live agent? And the customer may actually be confused by the transfer. They may actually think that they're talking to a live person the entire time. And then when it transitions, they may be a little confused about some of the questions if it's not well done. So our focus today in the yellow is really going to be talking about the live agent and the bot to live um, the bot to live issues that we see in our consulting work. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Brent and he's gonna talk about the first uh, couple of frequent chat issues that we see. Sure, good morning everybody or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, so, so let's think a little bit about uh, the implications of some of what Scott's talked about. So one of the things that we said is 
uh, oftentimes organizations don't really understand if chat's the best channel for the, the customer. Uh, and they don't have a, a really clear vision of how to deliver uh, to the customer expectations. And so some common queries that, that we see uh, relative to chat are, you know, do our customers actually want chat bots? And what kinds of queries should we answer on chat? Is there, is there a difference between something we might answer on chat and something that might take, for instance, a live phone agent or should be transitioned to, to email? Um, have we determined what types of, of transactions customers really prefer to resolve through chat? So when we think about these queries and we think about how to implement uh, chat and chatbots, how much thought have we really given to how to design the customer's service journey uh, to try to balance things like cost and efficiency with a really good customer experience? Uh, and even do we have the capability to improve the customer experience with a chatbot or is, is that going to be a detriment to the customer experience. So we, we really have to think about these, these things. When we think about uh, self-service technology use, uh, as Scott said, the, the subtitle of our CXMB uh, study was a year like no other. I think this, uh, this graph kind of highlights that. So in 2020, we are not quite, but almost twice the use of self-service technology as we have been in, in prior years. And I think a lot of that stems directly from the pandemic, uh, although we have tended to, to transition higher and higher every year in self-service technology. Uh, if you can go to the next, yeah, there you go. Um, the other thing to think about here is what are the demographics uh, relative to self-service technology? When we think about chatbots, chatbots are really a kind of self-service technology, although they often give the illusion of uh, an assisted transaction. Um, and I think one of the things that we can see reflected in the research that we've done is that the demographics really have an impact on, on the usage. So, you know, um, in the 18 to 29 band, you can, you can see where, uh, you know, almost everyone has attempted at some point uh, to use self-service technology. And that's really almost twice uh, what you would experience in, in a band that's maybe a little closer to my age, uh, getting up there around the, the 60 uh, years of age band. So um, I think part of that is reflective of the fact that uh, younger people really have grown up with self-service technology. It's been available their entire lives and they, uh, they're they very familiar with it. And they use it on a regular basis. Uh, one implication of that might be to think about how easy it is for someone in a demographic that really uses self-service technology to identify the flaws or, or the detriments uh, in the implementation of a chat bot or, or an instance of chat. Um, so, so I find this particular uh, graph to be pretty interesting. So have you interacted with a chatbot when co contacting a brand's customer care department? And you can see, so, so green is yes, red is no, and 8% is I don't know what a chatbot is. 78% uh, of respondents said yes, uh, they had interacted with a, with a chatbot. And I think one of the things to, to think about here is, um, if we were really implementing chatbots in, in a design that, that was well-designed to address the customer needs, um, customers probably shouldn't know that they're interacting with a chatbot. So when we have a high percentage of people saying, yes, I have interacted with a, a chatbot, um, that's an indication maybe that, that the limitations of, of the implementation of the chatbot is pretty apparent to the customer. Um, if we could go to the next slide, Scott. Here I think is, is probably the most important slide relative to the implement, uh, implementation of chatbots. So chatbot satisfaction is really, really low. So uh, in, in COPC, those of you who have experience with us know, we set a very high, high bar. We think high performance uh, in customer satisfaction relative to our processes. Uh, we should really be trying to, to target 85% top two box or higher. And in general, the public's satisfaction with, uh, with chatbots um, is really low. It's only at about 50%. And about one in three customers, if you combine the dissatisfied and, and very dissatisfied categories, about one in three customers is dissatisfied with their experience uh, in their, their contact with the chatbot. Uh, and so again, this is really strong evidence. The, the industry is moving. Customers are moving more to interacting with us via chat, via self-service technology, via chatbots, and yet their satisfaction is really low and they don't actually think that we're 
resolving their issues or, or providing a good experience for them in these, uh, in these categories and these channel types. So, so let's think about why that is. Um, and I really love this, this particular illustration. So when we think about why customers contact us, there's really two kind of uh, axes which they're, they're using to try to decide what channel they're trying to reach us through. So the complexity of the problem that they face from their perspective and the urgency with which they need to have that issue resolved. And so if, uh, if the issue isn't really complex, if the, if the need isn't really urgent, then lots of customers are going to try our self-service options. They're going to try the website. They're going to look things up in the knowledge base. They'll try to, to follow some instructions on their own to try to resolve their issue. Uh, but the more urgency there is, um, the more they're going to want to interact with the company in, in a way where they can provide some context to their issue. Uh, we need to think about the implementation of chat not as a substitute for phone support or a way to reduce the, the volume of transactions that are coming into the phone center, but as a way to support the customer in terms of meeting whatever their, their need is. If we introduce more channels, we're going to get more volume. People will use those channels. They may not know which is the right channel to try to get to to resolve their issue, and they may use multiple channels. As the complexity of the issue is, is higher, uh, they're more likely to want to speak to an actual live person. And so we have to think about that service journey of the customer. What's the actual customer need? How urgent is it? How complex is it? If it's really low complexity, maybe we can implement a chat bot that will resolve those issues efficiently and effectively for the customer. And if we if we implement that really well, if the, if the transition is designed well from chatbot to live agent, or if the chatbot itself, the implementation of that is well designed, the customer may never know that they were speaking to a, a chatbot and issue resolution will be high. But if the, if the transaction is relatively complex, then that's probably at some point going to have to transition to, to an actual person. Uh, and so we have to think about the design of that transition Right? What is that going to look like from the perspective of, of the customer? And to Scott's earlier point, uh, you know, can we do that in an effective manner without confusing the customer? Is it clear what's actually happening? And can the agent actually pick up from the chatbot and understand everything that's gone before that fairly quickly so that they can get to the customer's issue and, and resolve that? Brent, I think you had a poll here, yes? Uh, yeah, so, so, let's, uh, so let's ask a question. So the question I'd ask you is, when you think about implementation of chat in your organization, um, how do you view that implementation? Are you looking at that strategically? So you understand how it might fit into this matrix of complexity and urgency? Are you looking at it tactically as, uh, as uh, maybe another channel to add in order to improve the, the customer experience so they have more options for reaching us? Uh, are, we, are we maybe still thinking about that and we haven't reached a decision or are you just not sure uh, about what the organization's approach is? Okay. People are voting. Sure, excellent. So if, uh, if you want to share those those results, James. I will. Yep. Just going to get. Okay. There you are. Excellent. So, uh, so it, it looks like we're primarily we're either we either haven't made a choice yet about uh, about whether we should strate strategically or tactically implement chat uh, or we are sort of focused on the tactics of it so how do we you know we know customers want to reach us via chat but we've we've not yet really looked at the service journey to identify how best to fit chat into that so I think that's an important thing to take away from this so so thank you for answering the the, the poll you can go ahead and stop sharing that James um, I'd say that's pretty consistent with Scott's and, and my experiences as well, uh, that most organizations know they want to implement chat, but they're still not really sure how that fits into their overall strategy uh, or how best to utilize that to improve the customer experience. 
so that brings us to a second thing that we often get questions about, how to, how to properly resource uh, to implement chat and to do it in the right way. So common questions that we would have relative to this really are, uh, what's, the, what's the right level of concurrency uh, in chat? And I'm gonna talk a bit about concurrency for those of you, the, you who are not necessarily familiar with all of this. Uh, and then do I have the right skilled agents for chat? Do I have agents who are actually able to handle transactions in chat in a way that's going to lead to a good customer uh, experience? Uh, and again, this goes back to that initial question of, do we know what types of transactions that customers prefer to resolve through chat? And how do we, how do we sort of make our decisions relative to balancing cost and efficiency with a good customer experience? Uh, all right, so this is, uh, if, you can, if you can see this, this, uh, this shows a number of transactions coming in. So each row indicates transactions that are coming in concurrently. Uh, and this would be for an individual agent, for instance. Uh, so, so the first chat comes in, uh, our chat concurrency at that point, uh, we're, is, is our concurrency is one. We only have one chat that we're processing. And then as you move from left to right, you can see the second chat comes in and now we're processing two simultaneously. So our concurrency is two at that point. And then a third chat comes in before I've yet finished the first chat. So now my concurrency is three. And then I wrap up those first two chats and I am, uh, I am just dealing with that third chat that came in. My concurrency drops back down to one. Uh, and so on and so forth as, as chats come in throughout the course of the day. So my concurrency throughout the course of the day varies. It may be as low as one, it might be zero. I might have a period where I'm waiting on a chat to, to appear and I don't actually uh, handle anything in that, in that time frame. Um, in this example, the maximum concurrency that we've experienced is three. At any one time, uh, the maximum number of transactions that we were processing is three transactions, so our maximum concurrency is three. But you can see there are many periods throughout the day where we're lower than, than three. And so the average concurrency throughout the day is going to have to be less than whatever the maximum is that we've set. If we only allow at a maximum uh, agents to handle three chats uh, simultaneously, then our maximum concurrency will only ever be three. Our average concurrency is gonna be a lot lower than that. The reason why this is important is if you think about how you resource and you think about how you staff uh, to handle the transactions, the average concurrency is, is actually going to be uh, uh, smaller than your maximum concurrency and sometimes a lot smaller than your, than your maximum concurrency. And sometimes it should be a lot smaller than the maximum concurrency, right? Because there are implications to having to handle these transactions simultaneously. So if you could go to the next slide, Scott. When we think about handling multiple transactions at once, it means that we have to juggle a lot of things, right? So customers are contacting us, they're preempting each other. We're trying to figure out as agents, who do we prioritize? Do I stick with this customer because I'm working through problem solving? Do I, I have to get back to the next person because a certain amount of time has passed that they need to know I'm still engaged with their transaction? So as a result of that, agents do a lot of what's called context switching as they try to keep the threads of each of these chats intact and address these issues. They have to keep switching the context of, of what they're dealing with. Um, and as we add chats, each additional chat impacts their ability to do this in a nonlinear fashion. So what winds up happening is that as context switching begins to eat up the amount of time to respond, something called thrashing occurs. And thrashing is when we reach a point where there's a collapse in the provision of service to the customer. And that's not just a degradation of service. So, so it's not linear in the sense of, you know, we're, we're a little bit less responsive when there's two chats and we're equally a little less when we have three and so on and so forth. There comes a point at which everything just falls apart. We lose the ability to respond effectively to any of the customers we lose the thread of the, the communications that are occurring. And as a result, issue resolution goes down for everyone. The customer experience is negative for everyone. And so we have to think about in concurrency, maximum concurrency, first of all, what do we want that to be? What's the point at which things begin to collapse? And then we wanna back off from that and set it lower than that point. So that's the maximum concurrency. And then knowing that what that means is our average concurrency is actually gonna be a lot lower than that. 
uh, maybe maybe a fraction of that maximum con concurrency. Uh, and so we have to think about that. What's the what's the right level of performance that we're trying to deliver? Right. And I, I think Brent, one one other thing I'd like to add to that is that as the average concurrency uh, increases, if you think about it from the customer's point of view, as you, as you kind of mentioned, handle time will increase for all of the customers. So if I'm a customer and I happen to be at a time of day where I, I've got an agent that only has me to chat with, then their concurrency is one and I get very quick response times. However, as their concurrency increases to two or three, then I have to wait while they're processing James or Brent before they get back to me. And so from a resourcing point of view, you have to understand what's my maximum concurrency, what's my average concurrency, but also what's the impact going to be on the handle time uh, for the customers and their response times as a result. And so concurrency is very good from a, a cost perspective because we have agents processing multiple transactions, which you couldn't do in a phone call because you couldn't handle multiple phone calls at the same time, but it does have an impact on the customer experience. Yeah, and I think in a, in a couple of slides, Scott, we have, uh, we have some, some research on what the customer expectation is for an initial yep. response time. And I think that that's pretty similar in the ongoing responses. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, thinking about then, okay, so, so it's very complex, right? Processing chats, we tend to think in the organization that someone who's a good phone agent will naturally make a good chat agent. And I think that that's a mistake. And the reason why it's a mistake is in phone, you generally speaking are not dealing with more than one person. You're, you're talking to the customer on the phone. You may have to escalate. And when you escalate, typically what you do is you transfer that to a tier two. You may have to consult with tier two. You put the customer on hold. You go to tier two and have a conversation with them. You come back to the, to the customer with the answer. Uh, rarely in phone do we have a phone agent that has multiple people on the, on the, the transaction and they're trying to, to deal with lots of different people in, in resolving the queries that they have. Uh, in chat, that's something that happens all the time. So it requires individuals that have great facility with language. Um, we tend to think about chat as, well, if they have really good typing speed, then that's great. That's who we need. It's not enough just to have good typing speed. You have to have really good language uh, skills. You need to be able to type quickly. You have to have excellent reading and comprehension skills. And you need to be able to track multiple conversations at once. You need to be able to do all of that to be a good chat agent. Most organizations really are, uh, they may have some degree of, of gauging language skills via an interview where they're actually talking to the person, but that's not the same as chatting with multiple people. Most organizations don't have a way to test how well someone will do when they're having to track two or three or maybe even four different things going on at once and be able to provide a synopsis of, of each of those things and, and really track down the issues that are going on in those things. So we really have to, to think about what's the right agent, what skills do they actually need to have, and how can we test for those skills to make sure we know individuals are going to be able to provide a good customer experience. So I think we have a poll here as well, James. Yeah. So the question I would ask you is, is how skilled are your agents for processing chat? Do you, do you, have you nailed it? Do you know exactly what it is that you need in an agent and you're, and you're getting that into your organizations? Are you pretty good? You've learned some things uh, that, that you need to be able to do, but maybe this, uh, this webinar is providing some enlightenment uh, or maybe there's a lot of work that we have to do and, and you're not quite sure where you are, um, but you know it's, it's not as good as you want it to be. We'll give you just a minute here to, to answer that, uh, that poll. Couple more trickling in here. Sure. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, so looking at the results, so pretty good. So it, it looks like the majority of you think you're, you're pretty good, but uh, I am, I'm happy to see you've learned some things here that maybe you need to implement. We love it when we can help, uh, we can help inform people and, and teach you things that, that maybe you haven't considered in the, in the past. Um, I'd say, you know, not quite half, maybe a third of, of the organizations, you're, either you're not sure how well you're doing relative to this, or you know you've, you've got some things that you need to improve. 
Uh, again, this is this is a topic. It requires a lot of thought. When we think about the standard, the standard has lots of requirements about how to uh, how to think about the skills that are needed, uh, how to recruit to those, how to make sure you can validate people have the right skills. Um, and so that's certainly a, a source that I might turn to uh, if I were you in, in thinking about how to properly implement the, the right recruiting to get the right agent. Uh, okay, so, uh, so James, if you wanna stop sharing the results, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this was the research that I, I mentioned just a minute ago when, when Scott brought up uh, the fact that concurrency impacts the response time to the customer. And so uh, the question here was when interacting with a brand's customer care department by online chat, how quickly do you expect them to initially answer your inquiry? Uh, and what you can see is 83% of consumers stated they, they would expect the chat request to be answered within three minutes. Um, and I think that that's really important. So when we think about sort of the resourcing that we need to be able to get to that initial response, clearly we have to staff up to make sure that we're uh, able to, to answer every chat within three minutes or that's gonna drive dissatisfaction, right? That will cause uh, customers to be unhappy with the level of service that we're offering. But the thing that I wanted to point out, so relative to Scott's point, is in chat, there is an expectation that customers have that you as an agent will continue to pay attention to whatever their issue is. So if as an agent, you ask them for some piece of information and they provide that, their expectation is that you will get to the next step in a reasonable amount of time. I think this research, yes, it's talking about the initial response, but I think if we were to ask the question in a somewhat different fashion and ask it relative to how much time do you think should occur between responses, we'd probably see something similar. Now, I don't know how many of you have interacted with chat, but I know for myself, when I've interacted with a company in chat and I've sat for a minute, two minutes, three minutes waiting for the, the agent to respond to me after soliciting some information from me, my, my experience is not a good one. I think that person is not paying enough attention. Uh, and generally speaking, they're not getting back to me quickly enough to resolve my issue. It makes me have doubts about whether or not they're actually paying attention to me and whether they care about my issue. So this again is something that we really need to think about. We need to make sure that we have people with the right skills. We, may, we need to make sure that we staff appropriately to make sure that we're able to, to maintain that connection to the customer and make sure we're resolving their issues in a timely fashion. Great. All right. Well, uh, I think I'll turn it turn it over to Scott at this point. I've been talking for a while. I'll let Scott get a word in edgewise. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brent. So we'll we'll get to the the last uh, issue that Brent and I want to talk about today, which is, and we've we've sort of uh, chatted about this a couple of times. I, I guess that was a little bit of a pun intended, but we've chatted about this a couple of times uh, as we've gone through the. Uh, the webinar and uh, and really, as Brent said, you know, you got to deal with the uh, the strategic versus the tactical and and making sure that you have the right uh, uh, chat implementation. So certainly, if we have a bot in place, um, then uh, we should have a strategy for getting to live um, agents. And so some struggle, some organizations struggle with this. Uh, you know, the first is is it necessary to actually transition the customer uh, from bot to live, and how do we make the transition as seamless as possible? So going back to, I think this is the last uh, slide we have from the research, um, and this really deals with uh, customers who had a multi-channel journey. And a multi-channel journey is where, obviously, they had to go through more than one channel uh, from beginning to end. So certainly, uh, if a transaction started in phone and it finished in phone, then it wouldn't have been applicable to ask about a, a multi-channel uh, survey. So I think uh, the important part of this is in the last 12 months, 29% of respondents started a multi-channel service in some form of chat. Uh, and I'll put the highlights around that, but only 16% ended a service journey in chat. So certainly the ability uh, to, uh, to complete things in chat is really pretty, uh, pretty telling that it, it's difficult to do. And I, I think that this is really, if we look at this middle box here, six times as many people started in a chat bot as those who completed a multi-channel journey in the chatbot. So uh, as we talked about earlier on the pros and cons, chatbots are great from uh, re taking care of repetitive tasks, being there 24 seven, um, you know, being able to, to take care of those things. 
But from an issue resolution point of view, we can see that we really have some, some struggles. So it really illustrates the necessity for organizations to give thought to what is the customer service journey? Uh, what do they want in terms of their interaction uh, via chat? And how can we make that as seamless as possible? And that's probably going to be a blend of implementing a chat bot, but also having a transition strategy off to a live agent. So as we could see on the previous slide, customers uh, who reach out to an organization rarely finish a multi-channel uh, journey in a chatbot. And from we know from our research that generally the satisfaction with chatbots is extremely low, only 50% TTB, which would be top two box. Therefore, for organizations from a design point of view, they really need to have a strategy for how are we going to take customers from the bot to a live transaction. So we need to clearly define the rules on when it should move. And rules might be something such as if the bot cannot understand the customer query twice, uh, then uh, why would we ask the customer to keep typing in the query, even if they reworded it? If we're saying from the bot, I can't under, I don't understand you, uh, you know, could you please reword? If that happens twice, uh, then uh, we really uh, should, uh, should transition off to a live agent. Otherwise, we're just going to frustrate the customer if we force them to stay in the bot. Or if it's a known issue that is going to require live support. I mean, if the type of query is, is quite obvious that uh, we have not from an AI perspective or a programming perspective been able to get our, our bot to do effectively take care of this, we might as well move them on to a live agent as quickly as possible. We also need to have a strategy for ensuring that the agent is equipped with all of the knowledge on what has transpired in the chat thus far. As I mentioned earlier, maybe the chat has gone on for five minutes, eight minutes, 12 uh, minutes. Uh, how is the agent actually going to know about that and possibly about previous interactions that the customer has had uh, with the organization? And then you really, as an organization, need to determine your strategy. Uh, if you're going to transition people from a live agent uh, to a live agent from a bot, are you going to make that obvious or are you going to conceal it to the consumer? And we're not here to say one's right or one's wrong, uh, but uh, it sometimes can be a little confusing to the customer if they've been interacting with a bot and then they're transitioned over to a live agent. And especially if the bot has a name, uh, you know, so you're dealing with Brent and, uh, and all of a sudden uh, we're transitioned off to James, uh, what happened as a result? So uh, really organizations struggle with this and uh, really it comes back to your strategy on what you're going to do. Uh, with, uh, with your chat transactions and how you're going to interact. them. So let's get to our last topic before we get to the Q&A. So how does the CLPC CX standard actually improve chat effectiveness? The, this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with CLPC, uh, this is a slide that we always have in our, our training. And uh, this has been the objective of CLPC ever since the company started in 1996. Uh, we want to drive up higher levels of service, a response to the customers, higher levels of quality, and, and if we're in a revenue generating circumstance, definitely higher levels of revenue. But at the same time, we want to lower our costs. And so we don't want just cost to be our only driver. We want to think about what's the, the service, what's the quality and what the revenue objective and the cost objectives. And if we're successful at doing that, then we're going to have increased levels of customer experience and thus increased levels of profitability. So the CLPC CX standard is really designed and it is effective. And that's why we've been doing it for, uh, for almost 25 years that this can actually work. So, I'm not going to go through, uh, I'm sure you'll thank me, I'm not going to go through the details on this slide, uh, which is a brief overview of the CLPC CX standard. Uh, so there's really four categories. Category one is leadership and planning. Category two is the processes. Category three is the people strategy. And category four is the output or the result, which is the performance section. And we generally look at the performance metrics that are in place determine how an organization is doing in achieving its objectives on service, quality, revenue, cost, customer experience, and profitability. And if we're not achieving those objectives in category four performance, then we look backwards to uh, <clears throat> did we set out with the wrong objectives in leadership and planning, or did we have something in our processes or in a people strategy? And in the processes section, we have human assisted channels, which would be 
basically live agents from a chat perspective and digital assisted cha channels, which would be our bot strategy. So many people think of the CLPC CX standard as applicable for, for call centers and phone transactions, which is certainly true. And the, those were the roots of the CLPC standard. And as I said, when I started, there were no uh, chats. There were very few emails. Those things didn't, uh, didn't occur. We didn't have apps. However, as uh, the uh, CLPC standard has evolved, and we're certainly at release 6.2 of the standard now, we've developed... Uh, uh, guides for unique situations and transaction types. And there's actually a chat guide. It's available on our website. You can download it. And it talks about what are the unique metrics that should be implemented for chat. Brent talked about concurrency. We had some discussion about response times. Uh, we did uh, some discussions about handle times and where those occur. All of that is covered, as well as processes to ensure the chat is driving the objectives for higher levels of service quality and customer experience while lowering cost. All right. Well, I think uh, we're just about at uh, a quarter to the hour, James, and I'll, uh, I'll just sort of go over this slide, and then maybe we'll get to some Q&A. Um, so certainly, uh, CLPC Inc. has services that are applicable to chat. Uh, we have uh, our best practices and customer experience training, where we talk about all of these issues that Brent and I have discussed today. Uh, those can be done either, either as public sessions or dedicated. Um, we do consulting on organizations on best practices for their chat implementation using, as always, the COPC CX standard as our guide as we do that. Uh, we uh, could also conduct a, a benchmark review where we would do an evaluation of your chat processes and provide you with recommendations on uh, what you should do to, to improve uh, the customer experience and your cost and service objectives. And certainly organizations can get, uh, can get certified. Uh, we deal a lot with uh, contact center certification. Uh, some of those certifications are uh, phone-based. Uh, some of them are a blend of phone and email and chat and other transaction types. And some of the certifications are chat only uh, implementation. So certainly I want to let you know that the certification process and the standard is applicable to all of those uh, chat transaction types. All right. Great. Um, so James, I was wondering whether we had any uh, questions. Uh, we we... Sure. We did. Absolutely. So Brent and Scott, thank you so much. Really well done. Uh, thanks for tying together all the research and so much of this great information on chat today. It was, it was great. Um, as mentioned earlier, everybody, we've got about 10 minutes or so uh, for some questions and answers, and we've already had a few come in. Uh, so uh, the first one came in kind of early. Um, you referenced a lot of research in this webinar. Is the CXMB report publicly available? Uh, sure, yeah. And, uh, and so certainly, uh, if you go to our website, uh, clpc.com, uh, on the, uh, I think on the homepage, there's a link uh, to the most recent 2020 survey. And then uh, there's also a, uh, up at the top, I, I believe it's a, a research uh, tab, resources and, and research. And you right. can get to the previous versions uh, of the survey going back to 2015 uh, on that portion of the website, all publicly available and you can download it uh, as a result. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, okay, we had one here. Our organization has the chat button disappear from the website when we have too many chats in queue. Is this a good practice? Hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I think Brent and I could probably debate that with some of our clients. So uh, let me explain uh, just if people aren't familiar with the, uh, with the topic. Uh, if you have live chat, uh, some organizations will have the chat button uh, uh, appear. Certainly, you know, would you like to interact with somebody? Sometimes it's a little more pro pro proactive. It may say, um, you know, would you like to chat with us? And it's reaching out to the customer. Uh, but that button, would you like to chat? Uh, sometimes organizations have the button disappear. Now, it would be one thing to disappear if you're not available at two o'clock in the morning because you're not staffed in those hours. That would be fine. But sometimes it'll disappear sporadically throughout the day. And the reason it disappears is that their organization um, views yeah. that too many chats in queue. And so as we've got, I'll just use Brent's example with maximum concurrency of three. 
let's suppose we had 10 chat agents, uh, their maximum concurrency is three, then we can obviously handle 30 chats at once. Uh, we may only allow, once we get up to 35 or 40 chats, uh, we may think, oh, we're not gonna be able to answer those in a timely manner. Those, those extra chats that are in queue beyond the 30 that we can handle, uh, we won't let any more chats come in. So we'll make the button disappear so that, uh, now that'll certainly improve our service level, answering within three minutes as, as Brent had on one of the slides. However, uh, we would say uh, from a, a consulting point of view, we would really look at how often does the chat button disappear and for how long and at what times of day? And once we start to understand that and maybe we're open from, I'm just gonna make it up, uh, you know, seven in the morning until, uh, until seven at night, that's a 12 hour day. If the chat button disappeared for five minutes, probably not a big deal. If the chat button is disappearing sporadically throughout the day and it totaled maybe an hour throughout the entire 12 hour day uh, at different periods that it was not available, that's definitely a resourcing issue and it comes back to your staffing and scheduling uh, to understand um, uh, you know, when is the button disappearing? And not to be belabor WFM too much, but sometimes we're only looking at the arrival patterns of the chats that actually got through to the agents. And it's important to understand the chats that didn't get through because the button wasn't there from a resourcing point of view. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is not unlike blocking of calls to, to an inbound phone center. And, and the primary problem with that is you begin to lose track of what your customers really want, right? So, so yes, it can be a strategy to, to control the level of service that, that, that the people who are being served are, are getting to make the chat button disappear. But if that happens too often, then you lose the ability to really forecast accurately what your, your customers really want out of, out of your organization with, uh, with regard to chat. And then you're unable to deliver on, on that customer expectation, which may drive dissatisfaction. It may drive volume into other channels that might be more expensive channels for handling a transaction that could have been resolved in a timely fashion in chat if we actually had the right resources. Great. Thanks, Brent and Scott. Okay, next one. Uh, we did have another one just pop in asking about um, if this session will be available in a recorded fashion. And it will. I'll, I'll uh, mention that a little bit later, but on our website, there'll be a, a place for you to go and find all of our webinars. And this one being recorded today will be available to you. Uh, the next question that came in a little bit earlier is, is there, um, is it typically, is it typical to have a dedicated page for chat through which customers are funneled? Brent, would you like to answer that? Uh, sure. So, so obviously there's, there's a variety of approaches for chat implementation. Um, some companies will implement systems where chat's available as an option uh, from within a self-help website. Uh, and that can give the live agents some meaningful information about what the customer has already tried, where they're coming from within the knowledge base, what it is that they're, they're searching about. Um, some companies will, will, you know, actively have a specific portal through which they funnel chat so, so that, uh, you know, the customer has information about maybe the level of service that's currently being offered, whether the agents are available, what the, what the average wait time is before there's a response, gives them some, some information. Uh, and many organizations, I think, provide chat kind of on the main sort of topic pages that they have. So, for instance, if... Uh, you know, clearly some of us travel a lot. Uh, if you've ever, if you've ever, you know, tried to reserve a, a room in a hotel or maybe, you know, get a plane ticket online, uh, you'll, you'll see that some companies actually implement chat. So it's available where they think there might be a need for uh, interaction, either with the chat bot or with a live agent. Uh, so it's not so much a, a specific page as a number of different locations where they know there might be a, a need for it from the customer's perspective. So there's no one answer to this particular question. I, I, I think, again, it goes back to that idea of what's the service journey of the customer? What is the customer trying to accomplish? Uh, and how can we facilitate that to remove barriers to them getting a resolution on whatever their issue is? Great. Thanks, Brent. Yep. Uh, guys, guys, we had one come in uh, regarding concurrency, a couple actually around concurrency. I'll just ask a quick question here. It says, how does concerns, concurrency work in healthcare setting, providing mental health slash well-being services, and is max concurrency different in that setting? Don't know if that 
um, is something that we've addressed throughout this session, but a quick question we had. Hmm. That's, uh, that's a good question. I, um, I don't know that it's, uh, I, I don't know that it's unique to that industry as, um, as it would be uh, relative to what Brent was talking about relative to thrashing. And so, you know, regardless of the industry, whether it be healthcare or another industry, if the transactions are highly complex, um, then I think you're going to struggle to have a really high concurrency. Uh, if your transactions are relatively simple, then I, I think you can. The other uh, thing, and I, I don't think we really talk too much about it from a concurrency point of view, there's a certain amount of how much of the, uh, of the common answers are pre-written uh, for the agents that they can push uh, you know, a, a paragraph or a couple of paragraphs without having to type, they can push those paragraphs to the, uh, the consumer. And then the consumer needs to take that information, needs to digest it, and then needs to uh, process and type in a response. Um, as opposed to an organization which has very few pre-written responses and the agents need to type virtually everything. Uh, if you're typing virtually everything, you're not going to get a high level of concurrency because the agent is highly engaged uh, if you're able to push uh, the transactions uh, there. So I, I think really those two factors are the, uh, the complexity and uh, how much I'm gonna call it agent interaction actually needs to uh, occur is going to affect uh, the, the concurrency. Brent, anything to add on to that? Uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd also say it, a bit of it depends on sort of the, the urgency and uh, mm. severity of the issue that's, that's being dealt with, right? So, um, you know, if we're talking in a healthcare setting and we're talking about chat that, that revolves around uh, billing, for instance, that's probably a complex transaction, but not necessarily an urgent one. And, and so, um, you know, the response time that, that you need to have may be a bit lower in, in a situation like that, and you can handle somewhat higher levels of, of concurrency. On the other hand, if we were talking about something like the provision of emergency uh, services, or we were talking about a suicide hotline, I think you would want your concurrency to be at one. You don't want anybody dealing with more than one issue at a time because the nature of, of that interaction with the customer is so important and, and the, the impacts of getting it wrong are so severe um, that we just don't wanna be in that situ situation. So I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there's uh, necessarily a good answer beyond, you need to understand what types of transactions are we actually trying to resolve in chat. And uh, again, thinking about it in terms of things like severity or, or complexity or urgency. Uh, is go going to inform your decision relative to that. 